want you to hit me as hard as you can. Stanley Kubrick was notoriously one of the most demanding perfectionists in the history of film directors. The fastidious auteur had a personal collection of his own film equipment, ensuring precise dominion over every aspect in the process of filmmaking, and had an ironclad final cut clause in his long-standing contract with Warner Brothers. However, after the commercial flop of Barry Lyndon in 1975, Kubrick made a conscious effort to craft a financially viable follow-up that would strike a major chord with the masses. To do so, Kubrick deliberately set out to also create the scariest horror movie ever made. After going through scores of source novels, Kubrick finally settled on Stephen King's 1977 novel, The Shining, as his next movie. King, who already saw the big screen adaptation of his first novel, Carrie, was ecstatic over the thought that someone as accomplished as Kubrick would be turning The Shining into his next motion picture. Unfortunately, King had no idea that Kubrick would discard his adapted screenplay for the film before even reading it, bringing in fellow novelist Diane Johnson to collaborate on the script from scratch. And little did Kubrick know that the film, originally slated for a 17-week production shoot, would take 51 weeks to complete. With a prolonged schedule, continuous script changes, a chronologically ordered film shoot, constant retakes, severe actor meltdowns, burned down sets, and an original ending that was cut after the film was released in theaters, one must stop and ask about The Shining, what the f happened to this movie? The first major challenge that arose in the pre-production of The Shining was the tumultuous relationship between King and Kubrick. King's original screenplay adaptation of the novel was dismissed by Kubrick, who called King's writing weak. Kubrick then brought in Diane Johnson, whose novel The Shadow Knows he deemed to be more literary than King's, to do a page one rewrite. The script, which brazenly altered and ignored much of King's source material, took 11 weeks to complete. King would take such issue with Kubrick's adaptation, which he famously called a great big beautiful Cadillac with no motor inside, that he reacquired the rights to his novel so that he could spearhead the 1997 miniseries and mount a more faithful adaptation. King was particularly disappointed that Kubrick ditched the theme of alcoholism, a personal demon of King's while writing the novel, as being the source of Jack's tragic spiritual and psychological downfall. Additionally, King was disappointed in Kubrick's decision to cast Jack Nicholson as Jack Torrance. However, Nicholson was Kubrick's first choice for the role. King felt that, coming off his Oscar-winning performance in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, audiences would easily identify Nicholson as kooky and unstable from the get-go. <laughs> King insisted on casting John Voight, or Michael Moriarty, as Torrance, all American actors whose gradual descent into madness, he thought, would be all the more frightening. King also disliked the casting of Shelley Duvall as Wendy Torrance, as he originally wrote the character to be a blonde trophy wife who appeared far less vulnerable than Duvall. When he saw the finished film, King noted that Kubrick's script made Wendy one of the most misogynistic characters ever put on film. She's basically there to scream and be stupid, and that's not the woman I wrote about. Another change Kubrick made seemed to be a direct shot at King's source material. In the novel, the Volkswagen Beetle the Torrance's drive to the Overlook is red, while the snowcat Dick Halloran drives is yellow. Kubrick changed the color of the Beetle to yellow, and in the scene where Halloran drives through the blizzard to the Overlook, he passes by a red Volkswagen Beetle crushed under an 18-wheeler. It's been argued this proves that Kubrick was poking fun at the dismantlement of King's source novel. The Shining began filming in May of 1978. Kubrick, by now known for his reclusive personality, opted to shoot the entire film in his homeland of England. While the opening shot of the film was taken by a second unit team in Glacier National Park in Montana, and the exterior of the Overlook Hotel shot at the Timberland Lodge in Mount Hood, Oregon. The interior sets were built at EMI L Street Studios in England. To further complicate matters, Kubrick insisted on shooting the entire film in chronological order. As a result, he demanded every soundstage at Elstree Studios to be functional at once, with each individual set remaining lit and dressed for the duration of the shoot, which lasted nearly one year. This location also upset King, who insisted on shooting the film at the Stanley Hotel in Colorado, where he wrote the novel during his personal stay years prior. The exterior of the Overlook was modeled after the Timberland Lodge, while the interiors of the Colorado Lounge were patterned after the Iwani Hotel in Yosemite National Park. Due to Kubrick's manic obsessiveness with getting things just right, 
Filming The Shining took far longer to complete than originally scheduled. For example, the infamous shot of the tennis ball rolling towards Danny and his pile of toys took 50 takes to get right. The bar scene between Jack and Lloyd in the gold room took over three weeks to complete and twice as long to rehearse. The shot of Jack throwing a tennis ball against the wall took several days to shoot correctly. The scene between Jack and Delbert Grady in the blood red bathroom took 50 to 60 takes, according to actor Philip Stone, who played Grady. The long and arduous filming process included Kubrick's meticulous methods and attention to every detail in the frame. Jack Nicholson became so exhausted with the constant script changes that he refused to read new pages because he knew they were bound to change again the next day. As a result, Nicholson would often learn his lines minutes before filming. Nicholson spent so many long hours shooting the film that he would often sleep on the floor between takes and would immediately pass out when he returned to the London flat he shared with his then-girlfriend Angelica Houston. While Nicholson and Kubrick got along personally, Kubrick's infamous mistreatment of actors became an absolute nightmare for Shelley Duvall and Scatman Crothers in particular. The abusive mistreatment of Duvall was most infamously captured in Stanley's daughter, Vivian Kubrick's on-set documentary, Making the Shining. In the footage, Kubrick can be seen berating, ignoring, and insulting Duvall while urging cast and crew members to avoid showing her any sympathy. Well, I don't sympathize with Shelley. Duvall suffered a nervous breakdown on set and described her time working with Kubrick as excruciating, almost unbearable. Kubrick consistently badgered Duvall about minor performance details and demanded constant retakes. No, I can't. Yeah, but when you came out like this, you said, just, but, you know, you're we're sitting there because they say, wait yeah. a minute, okay. and then you say yeah. on the radio, but when you go. do it, you've got to look desperate, Shelly. You're just wasting everybody's time there. I can't even get this well, door can't. open. The scene where Wendy stumbles up the stairs backwards while swinging a baseball bat at Jack reportedly required 127 takes to perfect to Kubrick's liking. Although crew members have subsequently refuted such claims, insisting that the shot took 35 to 45 takes instead. Even so, it took roughly four months for Kubrick to film the final hour of the film, during which Wendy Torrance remains in a constant state of hysterics. Another report claims that the shot of Wendy climbing the stairs with a knife in hand at the end of the film took 35 takes, the equivalent of Duvall running up the Empire State Building. The demanding do-overs and constant reshoots were so tough on Duvall that she became physically ill by the end of the shoot and her hair began to fall out. And frankly, if Scatman Crothers had hair, he probably would have lost his too. The 69-year-old actor reportedly had trouble remembering his lines, prompting Kubrick to shoot multiple takes of several different scenes. The sequence where Hallorin and Danny discussed the phenomenon of shining in the hotel kitchen reportedly took 140 takes to get just right after Crothers misread a line. It allegedly took 85 takes to achieve the sequence where Hollering gives Wendy and Danny a tour of the Overlook. A simple dialogue-free scene of Hollering walking through the snow from the snowcat to the hotel was shot 40 times. Subjecting the 69-year-old to frigid winter conditions in Oregon where the shot was taken. When it came time to film Hollering's death scene, which was not in the novel, Kubrick insisted on shooting 70 takes. However, seeing how difficult Kubrick's methods were on his old pal Crothers, Nicholson talked Kubrick into shooting only 40 takes. The physical toll falling to the floor that many times made Crothers break down, pleading with the director at one point during production, saying, What do you want, Mr. Kubrick? Another insistence of Kubrick's dogged perfectionism includes Jack's infamous axe attack. Not only did Kubrick spend three days filming the shot with 60 different doors used, he also operated the camera himself when Jack swings the axe back and forth while chopping the door. At first, Kubrick wanted to use fake doors, but being a former volunteer fireman, Nicholson chopped the doors down too fast to be believable. Instead, Kubrick brought in a real door. And while the Here's Johnny line was not in the novel, the iconic moment almost never made it into the film as well. As a secluded Englander, Kubrick had no idea that Nicholson was referencing Ed McMahon's classic catchphrase from The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson and nearly opted to discard the line altogether. Now, it's become a cultural catchphrase. In fact, some of the most iconic images from The Shining did not come from the novel, including the creepy Grady twins, the elevator of blood, the 4th of July photo, room 237, which was changed from room 217 in the novel, and the large exterior hedge maze. Kubrick opted for the maze instead of the topiary hedge trimmings featured in King's novel, citing expensive and insufficient special effects as the reason why. In the novel, animal-shaped hedges come to life and attack Danny, 
Kubrick tested animatronic and stop motion animation during pre-production, but decided the technology did not look realistic enough. However, the maze proved to be just as difficult to create. First, the maze itself was constructed by mounting empty plywood boxes and weaving branches through chicken wire. Kubrick used a short lens and kept the camera dead level in order to make the hedges appear larger and more imposing than they were in reality. As arduous as the practical set was to build, nothing would compare to the finale when Jack chases Danny through the snowy maze at night. To create the appearance of snow, Roughly 900 tons of dairy salt was shipped to Elstree Studio and spread over the set floors. For the snowfall, crushed styrofoam was drizzled from above the set. The appearance of mist was created by spraying vaporized motor oil, which was so toxic it required gas masks to be worn on set. To make matters worse, there was no air conditioning on any of the sets, and the halogen quartz lighting rig in the maze became so hot that the working conditions became stifling. While the cast was required to act as if they were freezing, they were really sweating their balls off. Oh, the irony. Speaking of ironic, King's novel ends with the hotel burning down from an explosive boiler. But in the film, Jack freezes to death. What's even stranger is that, with two months left in production, Soundstage 3 at Elstree Studios burned down due to the combustible heat created by the intense lighting unit. As a result, the Colorado Lounge was set ablaze. Fortunately, Kubrick finished the scenes in the lounge before it burned down but the fire delayed production even further. There's an infamous image of Kubrick laughing in front of the wreckage, suggesting the irony was not lost on him either. The set was ultimately rebuilt with higher ceilings to make way for Steven Spielberg's Raiders of the Lost Ark. Kubrick and Spielberg would also forge a long-lasting relationship that would result in the collaboration of the film AI. When it came time to end The Shining, Kubrick had all sorts of ideas. In his original treatment, instead of having Jack attack Wendy with an axe in her bedroom, Jack was to surprise Wendy by popping out, grabbing her by the throat, and smashing her head against the wall. Wendy would then stab Jack in the stomach and leave him for dead. Jack would crawl behind Wendy in pursuit until she finally kills him. Hollerum would then show up and have a brief conversation with Grady. Hollerum would pick up an axe and chase Danny through the maze as Jack ultimately does in the final film. Danny uses The Shining to confuse Hollerum and make an escape. Wendy would locate the two, go absolutely batshit crazy, and proceed to stab Hollerin to death. Wendy and Danny would then jump in the snowcat and make an escape. Instead of ending the film with the infamous 4th of July ballroom photo, the final shot of the film was originally conceived to have the camera show the scrapbook detailing the Overlook's sordid history, which only makes a brief appearance in the finished film. A mysterious hand would snatch the scrapbook as the unknown person walks away from the desk. Obviously, Kubrick opted for another ending altogether. But even the ending he ultimately settled on was decided after the film was released in theaters. The original ending of The Shining included a scene between the shot of Jack's frozen corpse in the snow and the 4th of July photo. The scene takes place in a hospital where Wendy and Danny have safely escaped to. The caretaker Stuart Ullman arrives and tells them that they couldn't locate Jack's body. Ullman then gives Danny the ghastly tennis ball that rolled towards him earlier in the film. While this ending ensured that Wendy and Danny were okay, it raised too many questions as to whether Ullman was a ghost or not. In the end, Kubrick ordered every print of the film to be returned so the hospital scene could be excised. Kubrick had all the deleted footage of The Shining destroyed, but photos of the scene can still be found online. The Shining opened in theaters on June 13, 1980. The film drew tepid response from critics at the time, and was nominated for two Razzie Awards. Kubrick was nominated for Worst Director, while Duvall was nominated for Worst Actress. Neither won the dishonor. However, Scatman Crothers received a Saturn Award for Best Supporting Actor. The Shining cost roughly $19 million to make and earned an estimated $44 million at the domestic box office. Since its release, The Shining has become recognized as one of the all-time scariest horror classics ever assembled. As the film grew in popularity with the advent of home video, a slew of wild theories about the film's hidden themes began to propagate publicly. Going back to his days working on Lolita, in which the Hollywood production code forced him to convey the theme of pedophilia through sly visual suggestion and verbal innuendo, Kubrick has reportedly always employed subliminal messaging and encoded symbolism in his films, as depicted in Rodney Asher's controversial documentary Room 237. However, it's worth noting that Kubrick's longtime assistant, Leon Vitali, has dismissed Room 237 as gibberish. The first theory presented in Room 237 deals with the subliminal theme of Native American genocide. 
This one is less controversial, as the character of Ulma mentions during the tour of the hotel in the film that the Overlook was built on an Indian burial ground, and even required repelling Indian attacks from the hotel while building the structure. In 1987, film critic Bill Blakemore wrote an article entitled Kubrick's Shining Secret, Film's Hidden Horror is the Murder of the Indian. Kubrick reportedly read the article and contacted Blakemore, thanking him for noticing what other critics did not. The use of disturbing Native American music and sound effects are a vital part of the movie's memorable soundtrack, and reinforces the subliminal theme. In the kitchen, prominent framing of Calumet baking powder cans are shown with a Native American pictured on the label. A Calumet is a ceremonial peace pipe used by natives. In addition, the interior of the Colorado Lounge was inspired by the Iwani Hotel, named after a Native American tribe, and features several pieces of Native American furnishings such as rugs, tapestries, and wall paintings. Strangely, the giant sand painting of Native Americans that Jack throws the tennis ball against in the Colorado Lounge also resembles rockets lifting off. Speaking of rockets, another conspiracy theory regarding The Shining is that the entire movie is a veiled admission by Kubrick that he helped NASA stage the Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969. Remember, Kubrick worked closely with NASA on his groundbreaking sci-fi epic 2001 A Space Odyssey in 1968 and maintained such a good working relationship with them that NASA provided special lenses for Kubrick to use on Barry Lyndon. So the theory isn't all that far-fetched? Several pieces of evidence are given from The Shining to support the moon landing claim, the biggest being the Apollo 11 sweatshirt Danny wears during a key section of the film. In the scene where the tennis ball mysteriously rolls towards Danny, notice the shape of the carpet and positioning of Danny's toys. The pattern of the carpet and placement of the toys resembles the Cape Canaveral site that Apollo 11 was launched from. As soon as the ball stops rolling, the camera cuts to a different angle and moves upward with Danny as he stands up from the ground. With the Apollo 11 emblem on Danny's sweater center screen, the shot resembles a rocket lifting off and taking flight. After the cut, Danny slowly ambles towards the sinister Room 237, where he is later abused by mysterious forces. It has been argued that Kubrick changed Room 217 in the novel to Room 237 in the movie to yet again hint at the Apollo moon landing. At the time of release, the moon was calculated to be an estimated 237,000 miles from Earth. It's now roughly 238,000 miles from Earth. However, it's been reported that the real reason for the change came at the request of the Timberland Lodge, the hotel used for the exterior of the Overlook. In order to avoid guests from being too frightened to stay in room 217, the hotel asked Kubrick to change the number to 237, a non-existent room at the lodge. Still, the conspiracy theories persist. In addition to having several visual clues to the number 11 throughout the film, itself a play on the twinning motif of the movie, the phrase all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy is also thought to implicate Kubrick. Bear with me. The word all which starts each sentence has been viewed by some to represent Apollo 11 as in all equals A11, Apollo 11. Makes sense, right? One final coincidence very few people have spoken about publicly is the fact that Kubrick's final film was released exactly 30 years from the day Apollo 11 began its launch, July 16th, 1969. Even eerier? Kubrick personally handpicked the release date for Eyes Wide Shut himself. Another conspiratorial reading of The Shining pertains to the Holocaust. According to some theorists, the prominent use of the number 42 in the film relates to 1942, the year Hitler and the Germans decide upon the final solution. Not only does Danny wear a red, white, and blue shirt with the number 42 on the sleeve, Wendy is said to swing the baseball bat at Jack 42 times. And at one point during the movie, Wendy and Danny watch the movie Summer of 42 on a TV set that oddly isn't even plugged in. Not weird enough for you? Well, if you multiply the numbers of room 237, 2 times 3 times 7, you get 42. Yeah, pretty freaky, right? Kubrick reportedly had an obsession with the Holocaust and did extensive research on the topic in preparation for making the Aryan Papers as one of his next movies. However, once Schindler's List was released in 1993, Kubrick decided to scrap the movie in favor of Eyes Wide Shut. In 2018, The Shining was selected by the National Film Preservation Board to be added to the National Film Registry because of its cultural, historic, and aesthetic importance to the nation's film heritage. As you may know, a sequel to The Shining, entitled Doctor Sleep, is due in theaters November 8th, 2019. The Haunting of Hill House creator Mike Flanagan adapted King's 2013 novel and will direct the film for Warner Brothers. 
The film stars Ewan McGregor as an adult Danny Torrance who meets a young girl named Abra Stone, played by Kylie Kern, who also shares the ability to shine. Rebecca Ferguson, Jacob Tremblay, Cliff Curtis, Bruce Greenwood, and Alex Essa will also star in the film. So, there you have it. As you can see, so much craziness went down during the making of The Shining that we had to pause for a minute and wonder, what the f*** happened to this movie? And now you know.